So this is the second lecture in my um, Everyday Things series on light. In this lecture, I'm principally going to be talking about um, sources of light. Now, to understand sources of light, we need to understand a little bit about what goes on within molecules and atoms. As I said in the previous lecture, an important consequence of quantum mechanics is everything is quantized. When I spoke about it before, I was meaning it specifically in terms of the energy of a photon, but it's equally true within the energy levels of an atom or a molecule. On my figure here on the left, I have a series of energy levels, and essentially all I'm trying to show here is the um, kind of scale of the transitions involved in each case. I have my electronic energy levels which have the largest separation. This is looking at things like we saw in the Balmer series before, transitions between different types of orbitals in an atom. I'll talk about these a little bit more later on. I also have vibrational energy levels. Um, you've probably already done a little bit about this with things like infrared. Lower in energy than vibrational energy levels are rotational energy levels. Even rotations, even kind of moving around an axis in a molecule is quantized. The lowest energy level separation of all belongs to translational levels. This is the movement forwards and backwards, left to right and up and down of any molecule. It might seem less obvious that these are quantized, but it's a consequence of quantum mechanics that everything is. All of these transitions within molecules match to parts of the spectra. I've shown here that electronic energy levels have the biggest energy gap. And we have a relationship at the bottom that I show here where I can link the energy of the transition to um, my Planck's constant that I saw before and either my frequency, which is this new symbol here, or the one I prefer to work with normally is wavelength. So the change in energy between the two energy levels I'm concerned with is equal to Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by the wavelength of my um, photon or wavelength of my light that I'm looking at. So each of these match to different parts of the electromagnetic spectra and I've shown you this figure before but now I've amended it to kind of match what's going on here in terms of the um, transitions that these um, frequencies and wavelengths of light match to. If I start instead of at either side I'm going to start looking at the UV. This is my transition of valence electrons. So my outer shell of electrons transitions from for example a HOMO, highest occupied molecular orbital, to a LUMO, lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. In the case of hydrogen, the Balmer and the Lyman and the Passion series, this is what I see as my valence electron, hydrogen only has one electron. But if I take something considerably heavier, like iodine, um, I'm looking at the movement from the highest occupied p orbital to the next available energy level. If I look at iodine again, but I look at moving an electron from, say, a 1s, 2s, 2p, one of those, and excite that all the way up, it can't go into its 3s, 3p, they're already occupied, so it has to jump a lot higher in energy. And this is what we would call the transitions of core electrons. So this happens in the gamma and the x-ray region. And um, this is fundamentally where our difference between gamma and x-rays comes from. X-rays are caused by transitions, movements of core electrons. Gamma rays are actually caused by transitions within the nucleus of the molecule. In terms of wavelength, they're the same, but in terms of how they were formed, they're quite different. Microwave, uh, the microwave region deals with rotations of the molecules, the energy gaps of uh, the rotational steps within a molecule match the microwave light. And even though we can't observe them easily, radio waves re relate to the translational energy gaps within a molecule. Being able to think of the electromagnetic spectra like this and being able to marry this to different parts of different transitions within a molecule can often be really useful to think about the processes going on within that atom or molecule. I've spoken about how different sources of light are always being used in order for us to learn about what light is. I spoke about black body radiation when I was talking about Planck and the ultraviolet catastrophe. Ultimately, the consequence of that is hot things give off light. The hotter it is, the more, it, more light it gives out and the higher energy light it will give out. But I also have light coming from atomic line spectra and I can 
make gases hot and do this. Now in the sun, I see it as a black body, not as atomic line spectra. So we need to think about how we can marry these two off. Principally, when I talk about a hot gas, it's often easiest to either think about it in terms of a plasma or in terms of um, something like throwing sodium into a flame. It's not just by heating things up that I can get light though, although it does work in many cases. In the cases of flame tests, I heat things up to get to excite the light, to excite the electron, to give me the transition where I see the light. In the case of both flame tests and fireworks though, I excite up with heat and it's the transition down as the electrons collapse down into their uh, low energy state where they emit light that I see the colour coming out. In the case of flame tests and with fireworks, specific atoms give out specific colours of light. So for example here, strontium and lithium will give out red light. Iron, which I know is slightly difficult to read, is giving out yellow light. Barium, green. These colours are all matching to different transitions, different energy transitions within my molecules. The bigger the energy gap, the higher the energy of emission. So copper has a higher energy gap than strontium or lithium. This principle works exactly the same if I look at a low pressure gas. So when we talk about neon tubes, we're talking about very, very low pressures of gas contained within a tube. And what I'm doing in this case is I'm exciting the electrons into higher energy levels by having a large potential difference or a large voltage across the tube. As I apply the voltage, I excite the molecules into a higher energy state and when they drop down again they will emit light. That colour of light is again um, dependent upon the energy gap between the what I've excited into and the ground state. In the cases of helium, neon, argon, krypton and xenon, um, although we see just a single colour, the spectrum are often far more complicated than we can see to the naked eye. If I was giving this lecture in normal kind of lecture theatre terms, you would have almost certainly seen me use a laser pointer. Lasers, which stands for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation, work by the principle that light is coming into a sample, and by doing that I can make a transition happen within a molecule. If I imagine that I have a system here, I've got these, my S0 and my S1 are marking electronic energy levels, and you can see I've also marked vibrational energy levels on as well. In this case, I have an excited state already, and it can drop down to the ground state by what I call spontaneous emission. However, if I have that excited state and I introduce a photon of the correct wavelength to the system, what happens is it causes the electron to drop down again, and I see two photons emitting the system, or I see brighter light emitting from the system. Because of the way that stimulated emission works, I um, can see certain properties of the light. It would always be polarised and in phase. In other words, the light is always uh, aligned to the same direction and because of the way interference would work, they have to all be constructive in their interference pattern. Or if I've got things in phase, I see a higher intensity of light coming out. But one side effect of lasers is that if I try and do this, I'm going to run out of excited state very, very quickly. And so I need to form what I call a population inversion. This is a system where I can end up with a majority of my molecules in the excited state. To do this, you can either use a light source or occasionally um, electrical excitation like we saw for our xenon lamps. The basic principle of lasers is very simple. Ultimately, I end up with a very bright small spot of light because I have um, light which is coherent and in phase and um, the way it's formed because of, of these properties means that it is collimated, in other words it won't disperse very easily. Original lasers were formed from things like rubies and over time things like a combination of helium and neon were very popular at forming things like red lasers. However, most light lasers nowadays use exactly the same technology as we have in LEDs. In the case of um, LEDs, what I have is I have a semiconductor. So a semiconductor is something where I have a small energy gap between my valence level and my conduction bands, my empty orbitals. 
In a conductor, there is an overlap between these two bands, and so electrons move around easily. In an insulator, the gap is very large, and it's very difficult to excite into the higher level so that I can see any conduction. But in a semiconductor, a small amount of light is normally enough for me to um, promote an electron to this higher conduction band. And that's the principle of how things like CCDs in cameras work. I can also excite using an electrical current. The principle of a laser is I excite using an electrical current into the conduction band and as the um, electrons and holes that I've left behind recombine, they give out light. There is very little difference in terms of how a laser and an LED works when they are based on semiconductor technology, so I'll explain them both together. Here I've drawn um, three different types of semiconductor material. We have what we call N and P doped type materials and I have an undoped material. So something N-doped means that I've put extra electrons into the conduction band. This would be something like having um, silicon semiconductor, so a pure silicon block, and adding phosphorus, a small amount of phosphorus to it. There's extra electrons there to help with conduction. Undoped would just be pure silicon, and P-doped would be something where I would have, for example, uh, some boron in, mixed into the silicon. That's got a few extra holes, or there's electrons missing. Um, that would be a p-doped type system. Now, if I take this p-doped and this n-doped type system, one with extra electrons in the conduction band, one with gaps, holes, waiting for it in the valence band, I can start to move those electrons across that gap. By doing so, if I have a gain medium in the middle, as these two, as the electrons in the conduction band and the electrons in the valence band combine, then they give out light. The only difference between a laser and an LED is how much current is flowing in this situation. I will eventually reach a point which we call the threshold current where LED action no longer begins and light starts to display laser qualities. So LEDs are just low powered lasers effectively. LEDs have a poor dispersion, they are very unfocused, uh, they emit a wide range of wavelengths. Lasers, as I've already said, low dispersion and a monochromatic single wavelength. The only difference, the current that flows. So this figure just shows a little bit more about what's going on in terms of my electrons and my holes and when they combine I end up emitting light from the system. So. Again, if we were in a regular lecture theatre, a projector is working by mixing light. Projectors work by having three colours of light in the system, red, green and blue. These three can mix together and if I mix all three together, I form white light. But if I mix only two of them together, I can form different colours. Red and green give me yellow, red and blue, magenta and blue and green give me cyan. Based on all of these, varying the intensities of different colours, I can get any colour I can possibly think of that our eye can see. This same experiment is going to be repeated in one of your sessions, whereby I can combine three LEDs, a red, a green and a blue, and we can start to observe it as white light. Most white light um, LEDs are cheating by having a blue LED emitting the light and then using a mixed colour RGB phosphor to cover other wavelengths. Although if we put a dot of water on the screens of our um, things like iPhones or, or iPods and things like this, we can see that the pixels within our, our screens are actually made up of different individual colour squares. Here I show the comp what happens within the screens of your, um, of your iPads and iPhones and things like this. I have three different colour squares. These are made up by three different, color, three different energy gap semiconductors which each emit three different colours. So things like um, indium gallium nitride or, or zinc selenide will emit blue light. Um, I can change the amount of doping or, or change my semiconductor and I'll emit green and red, again, a different combination. I can change the temperature of the white light by varying the components of each of my RGBs. But as I said, most white lights are actually cheating by having a blue LED and a phosphor which will emit a very broad spectra um, to make the white light appear this way. 
I hope that this has given you an introduction to some of the many and varied ways that um, that light is emitted. I'm going to use the session that goes with this to talk a little bit in, uh, about these things in a little bit more detail. So please bring along your questions.